Hey guys, thanks for joining in on our first ever Sunday School Online. I know some of you guys might be a little disappointed that we can't meet in person, but I want to guarantee that this will be just as good if we let God do what He's going to do. So the format of these couple of weeks is going to be that I'm going to teach you a lesson on video following the exact same curriculum that your teachers have done, and so it should pick up right where they left off. After that, you're going to communicate and discuss with your Sunday School class uh, over the phone or in a group chat or even in a video meeting. And so I really do hope that you guys make the most out of this opportunity to just interact and have fellowship with each other because this will be as great as we allow God to let it be. And so that takes a little bit of effort on both of our parts, but I really hope that you guys push through it and just make the most out of what we have here. So I want to continue where your teachers left off in the study of disciple making. As disciples of Christ, we are called to be disciple makers. And those are two things that we often think of as separate parts of our walk with God, but they are actually the exact same thing. You see, one can't exist without the other. You can't be a disciple of Jesus if you're not out there making disciples. And you can't be a disciple maker if you're not a disciple of Jesus first. Do you see the conundrum? Now, now you might be thinking at this point, but John, I don't know how to teach people. I can barely even talk to people. How can I possibly be a disciple maker? And let me tell you that Jesus took 12 uneducated normal men, and he made them into the dream team of disciple makers. And there's no way that he can't do the same thing, if not something even greater in you. If I say the word authority, what comes to mind? Is it maybe your parents, maybe your teachers, policemen, principals, um, maybe even the president of the United States? Now, can we say that the president has unlimited authority we can't, right? There's no way that the president could tell people in France how to live and they would have to obey him because he has no authority there. Which brings me to our Bible passage of the week. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All the authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so this brings me to my first point. Why does Jesus have all the authority on heaven and on earth? And that's because Jesus is God. And as God who created the universe, of course he has all authority over that. And so the more important question that comes to mind is how do we respond to that kind of authority? And the answer is found in John chapter 8, where he says that all of his creations are known because they obey him. And so if we are Jesus' creator and we acknowledge his authority, which was granted to him, especially in our today's passage where it says, after he resurrected from death in three days, then we respond by following and obeying his commands. And so if we look in a passage of Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 through 11, it says, So that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory to God the Father. And so there's no limit to Jesus' power and authority, and all beings will be judged by him. Now, does this scare you? Does it frighten you? Does it make you uncomfortable? Because even though Jesus is the king of everything, he's still inviting you personally to have an intimate relationship with him as creation and as creator, as father and as son, as savior and saved. And so let's go back to our passage in Matthew, specifically verses 19 through 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end 
of the age. And so we have to ask ourselves, why does Matthew throw the word therefore in those passages? And it's because he's trying to connect two dots together. He is saying that because of Jesus' authority, that we in turn are empowered to go and make disciples. And so we can't go and make disciples without being empowered by the authority that Jesus has. And so that brings me to my second big point. What does it mean to make a disciple? If we want to understand what it means to make a disciple, we have to look back on the original. We have to look back on how Jesus made disciples. And he made disciples not by teaching first, not by ordering first, but rather by establishing relationships first. And so in the same way, we are called to make uh, intentional relationships with other people while purposefully teaching them the word of God. And so when we're discipling, we are not only teaching people, we are sharing our faith. We are sharing what Christ gave to us with them. And so if you think of it in that way, making a disciple isn't any different than making a friend. Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Did you guys notice anything about the order that Jesus gave in regarding those locations? It's because the gospel is a centrifugal thing. And what I mean by that is that it starts in the middle and then it starts moving outward. And so he starts in Jerusalem. That's where Jesus' ministry started with his disciples. And that's where most of it was conducted. But then he goes on to say all of Judea and Samaria, which are actually neighboring countries to Israel. And then he says to the ends of the earth, because that's the natural order of things. You see, when we minister, it doesn't start with a foreign country. It doesn't start in Africa. It doesn't start in China. It starts here. It starts maybe even, even in your homes. It maybe starts in your friends, in your schools, and sometimes even in your church. Because that is our Jerusalem. And so finally, let's break down that middle passage where it says in verse 19, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So what is that baptism a symbol of? It represents a new life. You see, when we go in that water, that's us dying to ourselves. That's what it represents. It means that the old me is no longer here. In 2 Corinthians, it says that the old has died and behold, the new has come. And that baptism is what represents that. We die to ourselves by going into that water. And when we arise, it represents Jesus washing away all of our sins and greeting us as a new being, as a new creation in him. And why does he tell us to go and baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Spirit? So why does he tell us to go in the name of the Trinity and baptize? Well, there's two answers for this one. One, it's because every person of God, all three persons of God, is relevant in salvation. You see, they all play an equal part in our new relationship with God. And the second point is because it, it reveals uh, his nature. It reveals who God is to us. Because he's not just a God that stands far and watches us. He is a God that came here for us, that is among us, and that is watching over us. In verse 20, it tells us to teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. In verse 20, Jesus commands us to teach those who we are discipling. And this is important because a lot of Christians come in on the belief that Christianity, our faith, is about coming to church and the salvation. And that's very misguided. You see, because what we follow isn't just the fact that if we believe in Jesus that we are saved, but rather that we follow his commandments and we accept him not only as Savior, but as Lord. 
Because there's so many different aspects about what being a Christ follower is about besides just being at church, guys. There's an expectation that's found to grow in the ministry and grow in Jesus. And so in order to accomplish those things, we don't just bring people to God, to Christ. We also teach them about them. So let's look at that last line of Matthew chapter 28. It says, and behold, I am with you always to the end of time. And this is a very important line for us as Christians because Christ is telling us we're not on our own here. He's not just telling us what to do and shooing us off. He's guiding us. He's leading us. He's holding our hand the entire process. You see, this is important because diving into other people's lives could be a mess. But that's what discipleship means. It means to be in all of that muck and all of that mess and just share life with them. And in those moments when that difficulty becomes too much for us to manage, we can look at the reward that he has for us at the finish line. And so what I hope you guys get out of this is that the Great Commission, Jesus' last command for us before he goes to heaven isn't just for like this reserved group of super Christians. It's meant for even the newest believer to the senior elder Christian at your church. It's meant for all disciples of Jesus that, are, that we are called to make disciples. And so in that way, God brings us closer to himself. And so I really do hope that you guys use every opportunity that's given to you and step out and just speak life into the people of this dark world. And so in that way, God brings us closer to himself. And so I want to encourage you to just step out in the knowledge that God wants you to teach others how to be closer to him. If you made it this far, I want to tell you guys, great job. I know it's not easy, uh, but so I do appreciate that you took the time and effort to watch through all of this. And I hope you guys wrote down some stuff uh, to talk about because I promise the group discussions is where it's at, all right? So I want you to make sure that you're communicating with your Sunday school classes. Hopefully your teachers have reached out to you already. If not, I want to encourage you to reach out to them and figure out how they're going to do it. And so if you have any questions, let me know. Comment on here and I'll try to look at it. Uh, but most of you guys should have my number, hopefully. You can also Facebook me um, and your teachers. You can always ask them as well. And so I love you guys and I hope you stay safe and I'll see you next time.